we need to tell women every single day that they're capable. We need to encourage them. We need to become role models for the younger generation so that they realize that being a woman does not limit them from becoming great people. If anything, being a woman is the most power powerful thing one can be. And, you know, worth, self-worth does not come from what society thinks of you. It does not come from how others think of you. Self-worth is realizing that you are more than all your accomplishments. You are more than all your failures. Hello, my name is Umesh Fadke. I am Gen X, but I know all the trends among young people, even though I don't live them. Therefore, it's my mission to sit down, listen, and understand the next generation through the Ideas That Moves podcast, which derives from the L'Oreal Group's sense of purpose, beauty that moves, and in Indonesia, beauty that moves Indonesia forward. Welcome, uh, change makers, uh, to the podcast Ideas That Move. Uh, I'm Umesh Fadke. I am the President Director of L'Oreal Indonesia. And uh, to open the podcast uh, today, uh, we chose the topic of women's empowerment, which is an extremely pertinent and valuable and important topic for Indonesia. And uh, to talk about this topic with me, I have none other than Chinta Laura Keel. She is a very loud and pertinent voice uh, for women's empowerment in Indonesia. Today is Kartini Day. And uh, I tell you, I watched that movie and I read about Kartini and I was driven to tears. For a woman to have the courage to pursue the cause of education when education was not available, not just to women, but uh, even to local and regular Indonesians uh, is really something out of the world. So welcome, uh, Chinta. It's a pleasure to have you have you here. Thank you so much. What an introduction. Uh, Honestly, I am very nervous for today, but I hope whatever we decide to talk about will be beneficial to those who watch this episode. I'm, I'm sure it will be, and I'm sure that they will benefit a lot. Today, we are going to talk uh, a little bit about women's empowerment, and I know that that's uh, very close to your heart, yeah. and that's why you also took up uh, you know, the brand ambassadorship of L'Oreal Paris, uh, because uh, you believed in what the brand stood for, yes. about feminism and femininity, uh, about science, uh, about empowering women. You're also a big advocate about our, uh, our foundation of uh, Stand Up, uh, which is uh, against uh, sexual harassment mm -hmm. but let's uh, let's start off with women's empowerment talking about education mm -hmm. you know i mean how do you think education will play a role as far as women's empowerment is concerned uh, what what is uh, what is the state of education in indonesia and how do you think uh, society as a whole uh, can mm -hmm. enable women as far as education is concerned education's a very broad category, but maybe I can start by telling you a little story. Mm. So when my family's uh, foundation first started rebuilding schools in Mount Salak, a very isolated region in mm -hmm. Bogor, mm -hmm. we found that many girls would stop going to school after elementary school for yeah. various reasons. Mm. Um, what we found was because they didn't continue with their education, they were forced into child marriage, mm. which obviously is illegal and wrong mm. because when you're when you're so young, you know, you haven't really formed your identity, you, you know, you, you don't really understand the world and to be forced into something like that could be and is most likely very traumatic. Mm. And so, you know, in order to stop such a thing from happening in that area, uh, we decided to build a junior high mm. so that there was no excuse for women not to be able to continue or at least we can encourage the local community to want to have their daughters continue right. their education and from there we had scholarship program program uh, programs that allowed them to continue on to high school mm. and you know those who were really motivated would continue on to university which was fantastic and what we found is with education it gave well all children but especially women confidence and that is key, the confidence to know that they're in control of their own lives, mm. they're capable, mm. and they can be someone beyond what society expects of them. Mm. And don't get me wrong, a lot of people think sometimes that I'm attacking certain, um, certain, certain roles, like being a mother or being a wife, and by no means am I, am I saying that at all. If women choose to one day have their own families and, you know, uh, 
stay in the home, I think that's something beautiful. I mean, you know, raising a family is something noble. Being mm -hmm. able to raise a child, to educate them, to make them have good morals and principles is something beautiful. But at the same time, women should not be limited from being able to pursue other career paths or a life path. And with education, you know, we found that these women started to have the courage to dream. Hmm. And that's key. The courage to dream is the first step in enabling someone to actually take risks in order to really strive towards them, correct? Mm -hmm. So like um, we, we found that by the end of you know, our whole program that a lot of women wanted to become teachers or maybe even makeup artists, mm. like maybe even work in the government. And mm. we saw we saw all these things come to fruition. Mm. And that was that was absolutely beautiful. But beyond beyond, you know, beyond the conversation revolving around formal education, uh, some viewers may not know, but um, I'm the ambassador of um, I'm the ambassador of women empowerment and child protection for mm. the ministry. Mm. And one of the reasons why I was very interested in becoming their ambassador is because after having lived in the US for several years, I noticed that victims of harassment and sexual abuse mm. uh, were given all the facilities in the world to get back up on their feet. You know, what I noticed in countries like the U.S. is when you become a victim of sexual harassment or abuse, um, you're immediately given social workers to help you recuperate mentally, hmm. physically, hmm. psychologically. Hmm. And you're even given a, a, a lawyer hmm. or a district attorney to help with your case. Hmm. And you do not have to be an American citizen hmm. to gain those facilities. Hmm. And, you know, even though I was abroad for many years, of course, I would always st st uh, stay in touch with what's going on here. Hmm. And I saw many cases in which women were often blamed hmm. for the misfortune that had befallen them. Hmm. Sometimes they would be punished hmm. for being a victim of sexual abuse. And I found this preposterous hmm. and absolutely unacceptable. Hmm. Uh, don't get me wrong, facilities in this country do exist to mm. help rehabilitate uh, victims of abuse, mm. you know, physical, emotional, mm. uh, psychological, it mm. exists, but there isn't enough, mm. you know. Mm. And again, why is education important? Because it's important that at a young age, you know, everyone is aware that they should respect one another mm. regardless of, of gender. Because mm. at the end of the day, we're all human beings. Yeah. You know, gen gender shouldn't be a factor to differentiate between human beings. Yeah. You know, educating people about the basics, educating people about, so to say, the common sense things yeah. is sometimes the most fundamental thing to do. And, uh, you know, the viewers will uh, possibly be aware of the fact that uh, L'Oreal Paris has a program called Stand Up to Street street harassment mm -hmm. uh, where we use a technique called the 5D uh, technique or is it 4D? Mm -hmm. I think it's the 5D technique uh, which we use for training people, uh, especially women, uh, to stand up to, uh, to street harassment mm -hmm. and also train people around them. Like you said, we, uh, we need to train everyone so that they are equal. So mm -hmm. we also train not just men but mm -hmm. women uh, to make sure that they identify, uh, you know, instances of yes. street harassment and, and stand up to that. So that's, uh, that's really good. Now, um, uh, slightly moving to the next uh, next topic mm. is about, you know, patriarchal society. Yes. I mean, I'm from India, you're from Indonesia, and we know that, uh, you know, we are a patriarchal society. Uh, good thing is that 56% uh, of Indonesian women are today in the workforce. The government yeah. wants to take that number to 65, but I think, I think they deserve an applause for, and the women themselves deserve an applause for getting to that number and getting the mm. education and the courage to move out and work and all that. Yeah. But, um, you know, what, what do you think? How does the patriarchal society, uh, you know, either undermine mm. Mm. Uh, efforts of women's yeah. empowerment? Yeah. And what do you think we can do in order to, uh, pro you know, uh, help uh, yeah. women get empowered? Okay, so, um, you know, this is the reason why I say that education isn't the only factor uh, that could help move, you know, uh, move us towards a more gender equal society. A lot of people think sometimes, oh, you know, sexual abuse only occurs when you're not educated enough, when mm. you come from a certain socioeconomic background. And that is absolutely not true, because mm. we witness these things happen across all sectors in the government, um, in law enforcement, in um, in private institutions, 
in educational institutions. It happens everywhere, irrespective of one's socioeconomic background or education level, which is why it is very important for us to take the bottom-up approach, which is, of course, educating men and women in, in schools, but also a top-down approach so that people who are already in the workforce, are already in all these different sectors doing what they do, can also be aware of, uh, you know, what is right and what is wrong. Mm. Sometimes, even when, you know, someone is highly educated or comes from a certain socioeconomic background, they don't realize that certain actions are unacceptable and wrong. Mm. And this is further perpetuated in the media, you know. I'm so glad that you know there are now a lot of platforms that try to empower women, educate society, and teach good values. But the truth of the matter is sometimes, well not sometimes, oftentimes, they objectify women, mm. they make condescending jokes, again, pertaining to uh, one's sexuality, and this creates a normalization of such behaviors in society, which young people pick up when they watch these things. Mm. So you know, the. What's unfortunate is we have to admit that media is one of the most powerful tools in shaping the minds of the people. Hmm. And if you're perpetuating rape culture, if you're perpetuating patriarchal values in the media or even like in, in the workplace, hmm. then people are never going to know when something's wrong or hmm. right. And I mean, as someone who has been working in the entertainment industry for over a decade, hmm. I say one of the best ways to, you know, stop the normalization of these behaviors is by speaking up. I know that's easier said than done, but I think the youth do a very, very good job of that nowadays. Mm -hmm. When there's an injustice going on, you know, maybe it blows up on a certain social media platform, people become aware of it. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I'm not saying that victims should force themselves to speak up if they're not ready. You should never force someone to say something when they're not ready mm. or share something when they're not ready. Mm. But if you have the capacity to, maybe you're the friend who wants to be supportive and wants to make a certain injustice known, don't for, don't 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 be afraid to speak up about it cuz that'll make people feel less alone. Mm. That'll make people real the, the more frequently they hear mm. that something is not right, something is an injustice, mm. eventually you know, people are going to pick up, hmm. you know, pick up this idea that, hey, this is wrong. There needs to be uh, a change. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And I feel like, you know, across history, you, you know that revolutions are always started by a small group of people who are consistent mm -hmm. with their message and unafraid to go against the norms. And I think, you know, as someone who belongs to the Gen Z millennial generation, hmm. I think we're slowly really you know, mustering the courage to speak up. And you, I, I personally have seen amazing changes in the last 10 years where people are becoming more aware that, let's say, body shaming is unacceptable, bullying mm. is unacceptable, mm. um, gaslighting is unacceptable. Mm. You know, these are all words that 10, 15 years ago here, your everyday per people, your everyday person would be like, wait, what are you talking about? Mm. Oh, you're being overly sensitive. Mm. Mm. You know, it's when we tell these people who are so negative and don't believe in what we, what we stand for, and when we tell them, hey, you know, that we're not being overly sensitive, these are the reasons why it's not okay, mm. that's when people will, will start understanding. So, viva la revolution for, uh, <laughs> uh, of, yes. uh, of Chinta Laura. No, of course, uh, a small spark that uh, starts an idea can obviously mm -hmm. uh, uh, lead to change. Uh, we just spoke about Kartini, uh, mm -hmm. who uh, who did that uh, a couple of hundred years ago, and uh, and today we are here with uh, with Chintalara talking about that. You were talking about speak up, and we have a zero tolerance for uh, you know any kind of harassment, mm -hmm. any kind of unethical behavior uh, in my company, and we have a program called Speak Up, where we encourage people who notice something like this happening. Mm -hmm. We are not saying uh, things may not happen, uh, but if they happen, we encourage people to speak up, yeah. encourage people to talk about it without fear of retribution. And the scores we get from people about uh, the question that I'm allowed to speak about uh, unethical practices mm -hmm. or stuff happening in the company that I don't agree with without fear of retribution, those scores are always in the high 90s. So, mm -hmm. you know, we are, we are trying to build a diverse, inclusive workplace where people follow the norms, uh, mm -hmm. behave in the most uh, appropriate ways and if they notice something that's not uh, not appropriate they uh, they call it out so that's mm -hmm. uh, you know just my my little plug for uh, for yeah. my my workplace in a place that I feel so proud about so 
moving forward and talking a little bit about uh, you know empowering women through technology yeah. you know, this is something that has been the theme of Indonesia at least for the past five years mm. where uh, you know unicorns digitalization and they are something that have been uh, mm -hmm. kind of you know giving uh, access to people yeah. who did not have access. What role do you think uh, these companies, what role do you think this new uh, development of startups, etc., can can play in mm -hmm. terms of women's empowerment? And, mm -hmm. and how do you think your NGO that you are thinking about uh, will be enabled by, uh, by people like okay. these? You know, I feel like it's so wonderful that there are so many um, new companies, new platforms that have allowed uh, people to acquire more jobs, mm. you know, and that being women as well. I think we were talking about this prior to the start of the podcast where uh, you found, you met a woman in Lombok, if I'm not mistaken, yep. who started a, a gorengan business on a certain e-commerce platform and is doing very well and is finding herself flourishing and becoming more financially independent. And, you know, these are the things that we're seeing, you know. Oftentimes people say that women don't get equal representation in the workplace and that's true hmm. especially in high rank positions but I feel like now that everything's becoming more digital you know women are realizing that hey you know I can create my own small business too I can be a part of something too I can flourish without depending on anyone and I think that's beautiful um, but if you ask me how has whatever I'm doing help contribute to that I mean I can't say if I've done anything to help but like at least I try to that's sure. the goal right mm -hmm. and um, on February 7th, which was you know two, uh, two and a half two, two and a half months ago, mm. um, it was actually the anniversary, my 15th year anniversary in the industry. Mm. And as a gift to society, I started um, a movement called Act of Love. Okay. And Act of Love is a movement that focuses on three elements: disruptive learning, um, conscious living or the environment, and of course philanthropy. Mm. And um, you know. I spoke earlier about the disparity between the rich and the poor, the disparity between the resources that are accessible to people between cities and rural areas. And um, something that I learned is that, yes, disruptive learning will allow young Indonesians to be more competitive mm -hmm. with uh, you know, those in other countries. But before we even try to introduce a technology in their education system, we need to make sure they know how to use technology properly. Hmm. So with the act of love, you know, what I'm going to start doing starting August is visit these isolated regions, you know, visit their schools, have people that I trust and employ to also, you know, help with this with this movement whereby we're going to help the students first, you know, uh, first develop a way of thinking that will allow them to first be more critical. Because mm. think about it, if you just give students a phone or a laptop oh. and you tell them, okay, this is your homework, go find the answer to this, they don't know how to distinguish between websites. They don't know if something has been commissioned by a certain institution and if certain you know piece of information is biased. Mm. You know, they have no way of discerning mm. what's, what's actually fact and what's fiction or ho a hoax. Mm. So, you know, we first need to tell them how to, you know, use this information widely, be able to discern between true and false mm. before we even give these laptops or phones. So first it's how to develop their minds to be more innovative, to be more creative, to be more critical. And then it's safe to introduce a piece of technology mm. in the hopes that they use it mm. to their benefit. Mm. So that's disruptive learning with conscious living and the environment, you know, we have a lot of problem in Indonesia with plastic, mm, you know, no. the usage of plastic, mm. air pollution, noise pollution. Mm. And oftentimes people think to uh, people ask, like, you know, why don't people care? Don't they care about the future? But then the question is, how can people care about the future if they don't even know what they're going to eat tomorrow? Mm. If they don't even know if they'll have shelter mm. to live in, in the next week, the next month or mm. so. And so how can we instill a sense of care in their hearts towards the environment without making them lose opportunities to you know survive mm. and so another part of act of love is empowering people especially uh, young people and young women on how to you know reuse recycle certain materials and create a product out of it mm. whether it's a tote bag mm. whether it's a purse and sell it 
in the marketplace. And, you know, indirectly, they're doing good to the environment, recycling, mm. you know, realizing that something that is considered trash can actually be sold and be worth something. Mm. And at the same time, it's contributing to their well-being. Mm. And that's, that's our environmental element. And philanthropy, again, it's part of the foundation that I'm establishing with my friend where we want to create learning hubs to help educate and empower and liberate young women and children so that they can stand up on their own feet. And so, yeah, it's actually a whole network of things that my team and I are trying to do right now and hopefully can in some shape or form contribute to Indonesian society and see a difference in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. My God, that, yeah. that was so, so inspiring. I mean, your, your education as a, as a psychologist and understanding of psychology is really coming through. I would have never, never uh, connected something called an act of love with disruptive education. But when you hear it about its disruptive education, um, conscious living and philanthropy, these are the things that are really important. These are the kinds of love that we really need to show to our society, to mm -hmm. our fellow uh, fellow Indonesians, to, to Mother Earth and everything put together. So really, really nice. Good to hear that. I mean, uh, again, um, we have at L'Oreal been contributing to, uh, to some of these causes because, again, they are fundamental uh, to the survival of the human race, to the survival of the Earth in the future. And so we took up this cause of L'Oreal for the future uh, a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and we've had sustainability built into our strategic roadmap for a long time. Uh, Garnier, for example, which is the number mm -hmm. one beauty brand of Indonesia, wow. uh, has been collecting plastic. And mm -hmm. uh, you know we have now, if I'm not mistaken, collected over 100 tons of plastic in the past uh, few months. And we want to become plastic mm -hmm. neutral. We have the roadmap to do that. So we are, we are making these efforts. And of course, you mentioned about the women in Lombok. Uh, we've been running training centers to empower women mm -hmm. uh, from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds for mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and enable them to become both hairstylists and makeup artists for quite mm -hmm. some time. And Lombok was an interesting visit because uh, there are a lot of women in Lombok who are takeaways, you know, yeah. uh, women who, who've gone as maids and household help, uh, especially in the Middle East mm -hmm. or even in Singapore and Hong Kong. And they come back when they are 35, 40. So they mm -hmm. leave when they are 19, 20, and they come back when they are 40. Uh, they have uh, very little family help. Uh, they sometimes get into abusive relationships. They mm -hmm. have no money because, you know, usually mm -hmm. the husband or the father or someone has taken their money. Mm -hmm. And and they're left kind of penniless and jobless. Yeah. And I met one of these women who, who we had trained. She's now become the kind of the godmother of young girls in the village. Wow. And she, uh, she told me very proudly, she said, I don't want any girl from my village to go abroad and face the kind of hard work and abuse that I have faced. So I'm training them to be useful and money, uh, mm -hmm. you know, enable, financially enabled mm -hmm. in Indonesia. And she had this young girl in her arm who's her daughter, I think five or six years old. And she's looking at her and saying, I don't want her to be a takeaway. I want her to be a doctor. Yeah. The fact that this dream could be enabled, mm -hmm. you know, kind of brought tears to my eyes. I was, yeah. I was so, so happy to see mm -hmm. that. That's, yeah. uh, and you know, something that stuck out to me that you had just mentioned is, you know, a lot of, you said initially these women, a lot of them are left penniless. They're often abused. And something that I love so much about L'Oreal is uh, their tagline, I'm worth it because you're worth it. And I think that's something we've been trying to teach young women or women at large, right? Like how can they value themselves? And um, we've <clears throat> talked about education today. We've talked about the systemic problems. We've talked about how can we empower women. And I think what's so important right now is with the platforms that we all have, whether it's social media or you know our voices, you know, we, we need to tell women every single day that they're capable. We need to encourage them. We need to become role models for the younger generation so that they realize that being a woman does not limit them from becoming great people. If anything, being a woman is the most power powerful thing one can be. And, you know, worth, self-worth does not come from what society thinks of you. It does not come from how others think of you. Self-worth is realizing that you are more than all your accomplishments. You are more than all your failures, no matter you know, what variables there are outside of you, worth is not dictated by those things. And it's a, it, is, it is a belief in yourself knowing that you deserve respect, 
you deserve love and you deserve to take the risk and you know face those opportunities that come in life and see if they work out for you you know because we all we all we all deserve to live full lives men or women and um you know, I hope through our conversation today, it's making women aware that, you know, they're, they're all worth it and nobody can tell them that they're incapable of chasing after what they want. Bravo, bravo. Yeah. I, I could not have, I could not have uh, talked more about our, our slogan because, uh, because you're worth it uh, in a more eloquent way. So that was, that was really, really good. Um, now I'm going to ask you some, mm -hmm. uh, you know, inane and possibly some banal questions. So first, I'm going to ask you, which is your favorite city in Indonesia? My favorite city, just so the audience doesn't think that I've forgotten my Indonesian, I haven't. Kota favoritku di Indonesia. Mungkin kalau pulau Bali ya, memang bias karena papa mama aku tinggal di Bali. Tapi kalau kota, 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 hmm, aku suka sekali Yogyakarta. Oke. Okay, karena okay. budayanya yang sangat kuat, uh, seninya yang sangat indah dan juga orang-orangnya yang sangat ramah. Oke. Okay. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Untuk saya, untuk saya uh, mungkin puncak. puncak. Really? Iya. <laughs> karena, karena musimnya, karena musimnya dingin. Oke. Okay. Uh, uh, semua uh, surroundingnya hijau, okay. jadi <laughs> jadi lebih nyaman daripada Jakarta. Easy yeah. to escape yeah. from the macet macet. Yeah. Jadi, oke. Okay. Next, favorite dish. In Indonesian food? Lagi-lagi tergantung mood. I'm a very moody person when it comes to food. Mungkin paling suka kalau masakan Indonesia uh, nasi merah dengan uh, sambal tomat, oh. tempe goreng, Ooh. dan gurame goreng. Okay. So, Sundanese food. Tapi juga sate lilitnya Bali. I love sate lilit. Aku nggak suka sate biasa, tapi kalau sate lilit, because it's seafood, I love it. So okay. Balinese and Sundanese food. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm I'm also a very moody person when it comes to food because <laughs> I'm always in the mood for food. So, <laughs> so you know that's just me. Uh, but uh, but yeah, a lot of people have asked me where is the best Indian restaurant in in Jakarta? Jakarta yeah, where? At my home. Oh. You have to you have to come home. My wife is an exceptional cook, so uh -huh. you can come home and uh, and enjoy the best Indian food. I would uh, love you that. Are you, uh, you know, I've I've been to India. I sudah pernah ke India. Yeah. Saya waktu itu, of course, landingnya di Delhi. Tapi setelah itu, aku dan teman-teman sekolahku camping di the, Ganges River. Okay. On the, the foothills of dekat, the Himalayas. Okay, dekat uh, mungkin uh, Hardwar or Rishikesh. Uh, yes. Rishikesh. Rishikesh. Okay, okay. Did you yeah. do white whitewater rafting yeah, as well? Yeah, I did whitewater rafting, and then after we spent four days there, kita to Agra ah, to at Taj Mahal then Fort of Agra. Okay. So I, I've been to India. I, I really liked it. So Chinta, do you want to uh, say anything, last words to the for the audience in closing or something like that? Absolutely. Jadi aku tadi membicarakan sebuah gerakan yang namanya Act of Love. Dan aku benar-benar semua yang nonton hari ini kalau bisa mengikuti gerakan ini karena ini sebuah gerakan yang aku lihat akan ada dalam jangka panjang di dunia di mana apa ya dunia digital semakin merajalela dan kita melihat orang-orang sering menghakimi, menjatuhkan sama satu sama lain dan menggunakan teknologi untuk berbuat jahat. Mari kita merubah itu karena seharusnya setiap aksi diakari rasa cinta dan memang itu kedengarannya sangat idealis. Tapi kenapa aku mengatakan ini? Karena sudah waktunya kita merubah paradigma yang ada di negara ini di mana seharusnya kita mengangkat satu sama lain dan memberdayakan satu sama lain agar kita semua bisa memenuhi potensi diri kita sebagai manusia. So kalau teman-teman ingin ikut gerakan Act of Love, terus pantau social media aku. Tapi in the meantime, kalau ada sebuah um, quote yang kalian suka atau konten yang kalian buat atau apapun itu yang kalian merasa menyebarkan nilai-nilai positif yang dapat membantu orang lain belajar posting aja di social media kalian dengan menggunakan hashtag act of love dan hashtag AOL killers and trust me um, on your worst days continue to tell yourself that you are worth it because of your act of love, 
you are also worth it. So thank you very thank much you. for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chinta, for taking the time off. Thank you for making me feel comfortable in my first podcast uh, with a celebrity. <laughs> I want to thank L'Oreal Paris. I, of course, want to thank the entire team behind this podcast uh, that have made this possible. Obviously, the team from Narasi uh, TV and my team at L'Oreal uh, that have made uh, made this possible and that they gave me the courage uh, to come here and sit and do this, uh, this interview. Uh, I did speak about a lot of campaigns that uh, L'Oreal is doing. Uh, there was talk about L'Oreal for the future. Uh, there was talk about uh, L'Oreal for women in science, which I didn't mention, but it's a very big program that we do. And of course, this uh, podcast was about women's empowerment. Uh, women's empowerment starts with protecting women. And one of the things we need to protect them from is from street harassment. And for that, we have a program called Stand Up, which is supported by L'Oreal Paris. If you want to know more, please go to standupindonesia.com. That is standup-indonesia.com. And you can access the training. You can access materials over there. Please participate in that training. Please certify yourself. The more people get, uh, get certified in Indonesia against uh, this uh, harassment, uh, the better Indonesian society will be. And the dreams that we all have, Chinta has, we have for Indonesia will be fulfilled. Thank you, Changemakers. Thank you for watching. Uh, I hope to see you in the next episode. Please don't forget, uh, all my YouTubers say something, I forgot that. What do they say? Don't forget to share. Don't forget to share, like, like comment, and comment, and subscribe. Share, like, <laughs> comment, and subscribe. The bell icon. Thank you very much. <laughs>